το σου το εισπνό. Ουδή το σου το αδύναμο συστή. Έκαστο σε πόε τάφτη. Welcome to the Silver Mines of Lavrion. The mines make me nervous. All those fumes can't be safe to inhale day in and day out. The Lavrion Silver Mines were discovered between Thorikos and Cape Sunion, near Athens. They were rich in the mineral Galena and provided Athens with much of the silver necessary to mint its currency. Because of this, the mines were invaluable to the city, and the resources they provided helped turn Athens into one of the most powerful states in Greece. We will meet again after you've seen what the mines have to offer. Farewell for now, Wanderer. Silver mines were extremely rare in ancient Greece, which only increased their importance. Athens started exploiting the Lavrian silver mines at the end of the 6th century BCE and used its metal to produce its currency. Production at the mines exploded around 485 BCE when an especially rich vein was discovered. The mine's abundant silver made Athens one of the wealthiest cities in Greece. They also provided the resources necessary to build a fleet large enough to defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. In short, the Lavrian mines played an integral part in the emergence of Athens as a Greek superpower. Exploiting the mine's resources required a lot of labor. To meet this requirement and save on cost, Athens leased out mining concessions to its citizens, who had their slaves to do most of the work, alongside poor day laborers. In the 5th century BCE alone, there were anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 people toiling in the mines of Lavrion. Together, the workers managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver per year. Mining in Lavrion was a two-step process. First, the ore was extracted, and then it was refined. It took about 16 kilograms of raw ore to produce a single pure silver drachma of about four grams. Recovered artifacts from the mines provide some insight into the specifics of the mining process. Galleries were dug to follow the veins of ore. They were small and did not offer much space for the workers. They were also hand cut, and it's believed that it took whole days to dig only a few centimeters. Once the galleries finally reached the veins, the ore was extracted and then crushed on mortar stone to prepare it for washing. Mine workers used washeries to help clean rock from the ore. The washing process required a large supply of water, but Lavrion was an infamously dry region. To compensate, cisterns were built in the mining area to collect and conserve seasonal rainwater. 
Once enough water had accumulated, workers poured it into wooden troughs containing rock and ore. The water's flow separated the lighter grains of rock from the heavier ore, which was caught in depressions at the bottom of the trough. The newly cleaned ore was collected for refinement, and the water was redirected back into a tank to be reused later. Once the ore was clean and dry, it was ready for smelting. Its purpose was to isolate the silver in the ore. To do this, the ore was placed in a conical furnace filled with combustible charcoal. Bellows pumped air into the furnace to control the temperature. Inside, the ore burned, emitting a toxic smoke that was evacuated through a chimney. Eventually, the silver alloy was separated from the slag and collected for the last step in the refinement process, cupellation. Cupellation removed any leftover lead from the silver. The smelted alloy was placed in a cupel, an absorbent bowl made of bone ashes. It was then put in a furnace, where it absorbed the lead and left only silver behind. While the mines of Lavrion belonged to Athens, the city frequently leased them to private citizens who exploited the site for anywhere from three to ten years. These citizens enlisted slaves and poor day laborers to carry out most of the work. The workers had a very low life expectancy, about three to five years, due to the hazardous working conditions. The dangers they faced included toxic lead vapor in the air and lung-choking dust in the galleries. However, they were fed well enough to keep up their work, and their combined labor managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver a year. I hope you enjoyed your trip through the mines. We talk so much of Athens's glory. But we often forget the city's power was due to tremendous amounts of work. Work that often had a great human cost. What else would you like to do? Excellent. Let's begin. What was the last step 
in the silver refinement process. Yes, copulation removed any remaining lead, leaving only the silver behind. Now, for the second question. How did workers acquire water for the ore washing process? Correct. The workers used cisterns to collect the seasonal rainwater. Now, the final question. Which famous battle did the mines help Athens win? Correct. The Athenians used silver from the mines to finance a massive fleet for the Battle of Salamis. It's clear your visit has taught you much. A job well done, Wanderer. Of course. Please follow me. The moth, the mothakis are one of the less known, are, the, are one of the less well-known classes of ancient Spartan society. Most of what is known of them is the stuff of hy hypotheses and theories. They were either illegitimate children of Spartan fathers and helot or koi mothers, orphans whose training was sponsored by guardians, or poor people whose training was paid for by wealthier Spartan families. Othakis accompanied Spartan boys in the Agoge as their companions, or Centrophoi. Though they did not share the same rights as citizens, they, they could eventually join the Spartan elite if they completed their training, or if their patron bought them a unit of land known as a Kleros. Fulfilling these conditions granted them citizenship and allowed them to join the Spartan military. Rin sources attest that some Othakis, such as Gilip Gilipos, became accomplished military leaders during the Peloponnesian War. In fact, it's been suggested that Lysander, the famous Spartan admiral instrumental in winning the aforementioned war, was a Malthax as well.
storyboards are crucial to mapping out a sequence of events. These storyboards by Miguel Bucard show the hero's family sharing some dramatic moments at the top of the treacherous Mount Tayetos. This storyboard demonstrates the terrible decision made by Nikolaus. Excuse me. The Sporan army encampment in Megari sprawls across the landscape. Tents house weary soldiers, shields, and spears neatly arranged to be quickly grabbed if the Athenians should attack. These camps are a maze of tents and low buildings, temples, and houses overtaken by war and generals, and are always well guarded. The layout of the locations need to feel credible as though it could be lived in and at the same time need to fit within the game metrics of fight and stealth, explains World Director Benjamin Hall. Anywhere in the world where the player feels themselves against enemies are designed to be a homogenous blend between art and design.
Artemis was the daughter of Zeus and Leto, and Apollo's twin sister. A virgin and a huntress, she was one of the most important Olympian deities and presided over crucial aspects of life. Girls transitioned to womanhood, childbirth, the rearing of children, but also Spartan boys' rights of transition to manhood and certain aspects of war. She was most commonly depicted with a bow and arrow and associated with deer. Artemis had several cults in Sparta, and the most important of them was Artemis Orthia. This cult was closely associated to the Spartan education system, the Agogi. Many dedications to Aletheia, the goddess associated with good deliveries, was found in the sanctuary, showing the two deities' roles were closely related. A dedicated river tool has been developed in order to render believable river layouts in a Greek mountainous landscape. Here's an in-game image of a spring river. Vincent Lamonte, assistant art director and lead biome artist. Pretty. According to Pausanias, the two most important Spartan temples were the Temple of Artemis Orthia and the Temple of Athena Chalcoikos. Pausanias describes the building of the sanctuary of Athena Chalcoikos in great detail. It was located on the Acropolis of Sparta, west of the Agora. Its construction was started by the mythic king of Sparta, Tidarios, and was completed by the Spartan sculptor Gitiadas in the 6th century BCE. The epitaph Chal Koikos, house from bronze, was attached to this temple due to the bronze and copper decorations on its walls. These embossed shield sheets depicted mythological scenes like Heracles' labors, achievements of the sons of Tidarios, the legend of Perseus and Medusa, and the birth of Athena. The bronze decorations and the bronze statue of Athena were the works of Gitiadas, who also composed a hymn to the goddess. Praise be Athena. Get down, get down. The 
This barn banner bears the letter Lambda, standing for Lacedaemon, the other name of Sparta. On their coins, the initials were Lambda and Alpha, L-A. This emblem is inspired by Spartan shields bearing the Lambda. While there is no archaeological evidence of these shields' decoration, they are known from textual evidence. A fragment of a comedy by Eupolis tells that the sight alone of the, on the, of the Lambdas on Spartan shields was enough to frighten Cleon. On other occasions, shields were decorated by varied iconographies, as shown on numerous vases depicting warriors. The Acropolis of Sparta consisted of several buildings that dated from different chronological periods, from the Archaic to the Byzantine era. At the top of the Acropolis was the sanctuary of Athena Chalkaikos, dating to the 6th century BCE. It was originally a sanctuary of Pitani, as confirmed by archaeological discoveries dated as earlier as the Mycenaean period. Near the sanctuary of Athena was the ancient theater of Sparta. The theater seen in-game is based on a scripture dated to the Roman period. The theater probably had a wooden stage, a fact supported by several inscriptions from the 2nd century CE. Excavations next to the theater also revealed connected shops. The Acropolis of Sparta also held visible traces of the Skias, the semicircular building of the archaic classical periods, both visible repairs from the Roman period. Dionysus was the Greek god associated with wine, ritual, madness, and theater. This temple was set on a hill opposite the Spartan Acropolis. The site was called Colonna, the hill, which gave the god his epitaph, Colonatas. The temple seems to have been a place of worship for women. When approaching adulthood, girls may have been initiated into the mysteries of Dionysus linked to this temple. During the god's annual feast, Pausanias tells of a foot race involving 11 girls, the Dionysiads. This custom would have come from Delphi. According to many ancient authors, Spartan women were an exception among other Greek women. Authors from Athens were both fascinated and afraid of these figures, and presented them as both powerful and licentious. In the warfare state of Sparta, girls were educated with a eugenic perspective to become the future wives and mothers of warriors. According to Queen Gorgo, they were the only Greek women who gave birth to real men, and were the only ones who commanded to men. This famous sentence showed the authority of Spartan women in their city. In addition to the desire for strength, gymnastics and sports were also emphasized in education to make the young women attractive enough to marry. This included being well-versed in music, dancing, singing, and poetry. Spartan women dedicated themselves to intensive physical exercise and led very different lives from their Athenian counterparts. They were more autonomous and more free than many Greek women in ancient times. They also may have trained themselves to wrestle. 
One purpose of this training could have been for the defense of the city and of their children in the event of an attack on Spartan territory. Fearsome and formidable, these warriors are unmatched throughout Greece and the known world. These character studies, these character studies by artist Fred Rambald, show the different types of warriors the hero will encounter in Sparta, from the heavily armored brute to the more nimble, spear-wielding fighter and the brawler, replete in gold armor and a heavy ram's head hammer. The Periokoi were indigenous non Spartan freemen who lived in the periphery of Sparta, but did not have political rights. They formed autonomous communities and developed local econo economies because, unlike the Spartans, they engaged in commerce and manufacturing. In other words, while Spartans concentrated on war, the Periokoi focused on everything else. They could be carpenters, merchants, farmers, and fishermen, among many other professions. Their dependency on Sparta did now, did now, did, is that supposed to be, did not allow them to develop a proper economy? But at the same time, they aided the Spartans by allowing them to concentrate on military matters. It is also believed that the Perorkoi procured of the medals and crafted the arms the Spartans used in battle. Hiramos. In one of the Athenian general Thucydides' historical writings, he described a debate between the Spartan king Archidamos and one of the Sparta's ephors over whether or not the city should engage Athens and the Delian League in what would later become the Peloponnesian War. Surprisingly, Archidamos argued for a more cautious approach stating that their enemies were numerous, well-funded, and more skilled when it came to naval engagements. He believed that Sparta should not be so hasty in picking a fight until it was more prepared. The ephor, meanwhile, appealed to the city's honor and said that the other only response worthy of strong Spartans was to vote for war. Despite being the king, Achidamos' efforts to postpone the war were eventually overruled. Four Spartan kings played important roles in the Peloponnesian War. Archidamos II, his elder son Agis II, Pleistoana Pleistoanax, and his son Pausanias. In 464 BCE, Archidamos II managed to quell a Helot revolt following an earthquake that shook the city to its core. A few years later, in 445, he, his double in kingship, Pleistoanax, was exiled for presumably taking a bribe from the Athenian statesman Pericles, someone Archidamos had previously been on friendly terms with. During the first part of the Peloponnesian War, which was named the Archidamian War after Archidamos, the king marched 
against Attica in 431 BCE, 430 BCE, and 428 BCE. He was succeeded by his son Aegis II in 427 or 426, who was appointed a guardian because of his young of age. His young age. Aegis did not manage to invade Attica, but together with Ple with Ple Pleistoanax, who had returned from exile, they signed a treaty with the Athenians in 421 BCE known as the Peace of Nicias. During the third part of the war, it was Aegis' decision to occupy Decelia and control Athens' countryside, as well as access to the Lorian mines. This move was crucial because Athens lost the possibility to mint coins with Lorian silver, restricting the city's ability to finance the war and pay for mercenaries and contribute and contributing to Athens' eventual surrender in 404 BCE. Pausanias, meanwhile, was the king of Sparta who laid siege to Athens in collaboration with the admiral Lysander, which culminated in Sparta's decisive victory in Aegos Potamoi in 405 BCE. This is not the way out. Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux, the Dioscoroi, were divine twins, sons of Zeus and Leda, and brothers of Helen and Clytemnestra. One of them human and the other divine, they were linked to Sparta, as myth stated they were born on Mount Tayetos. The Dioscoroi were the protectors of the Spartan kings and took turns in the royal duty. They helped the Spartans in battle, and they were associated with horsemanship as well as with athletic contests. In art, they were often represented with their sister, Helen. An important number of marble reliefs of the Dioscoroi have been found in excavations of the Spartan area, and are now kept in the Sparta Museum. The Lacedaemonian army was not exclusively made up of official Spartan citizens. The army was composed of all male Lacedaemonians aged 20 to 60, and occasionally even older, regardless of social class. Because of this, Helots and Peroikoi often fought alongside Spartan homoioi citizens. Just out here. Nope, I've done you already.
Hey, Grandpa. Welcome to Laconia, visitor. You're here to learn about Spartan society, yes? Then I won't stop you. Sparta is a glorious place, and you should feel honored to be here. Honored, and perhaps somewhat frightened. Sparta had a unique hierarchy, especially compared to the rest of Greece. Everyone had their place, and you will soon learn what those places were. I will find you again once your visit has ended. Until then, visitor. Spartan society was structured around austerity, self-sufficiency, and a hostility towards foreign elements. It was divided into three social classes, citizens, perioikoi, and helots. Citizens were called Spartans, or homoioi. They were free men and women with mostly equal rights and wealth, though their contributions to political life were extremely limited. The perioikoi lived in surrounding areas under Spartan control. They cultivated the land and were primarily merchants and craftsmen. They were also part of the army, and their lands were the first line of defense in the event of a hostile attack. Helots were Sparta's lowest class. They were people who had lost their freedom to the Spartans, and they served the city as slaves. Helots were considered property instead of people. As a result, they had no political or civil rights. Helots made up the majority of Sparta's population. According to Polydeuces, they lingered between slavery and freedom. Two elements made Helots differ from other slaves. They were allowed to form their own families, and they were publicly owned by the city of Sparta instead of private citizens. Because Helots were deemed public property, they could not be sold as merchandise. They mostly worked to cultivate the land, but also fought in wars alongside the Spartans. While they gave the fruits of their labor to Sparta, they also kept a fair part of it for themselves. This practice allowed some helots to make enough money to buy their own freedom. Alternatively, if a helot served the state well enough in military campaigns, they could also be granted civil rights. The founding of Sparta is dated around the 9th century BCE. Historical information about the city is limited, but it was known to extend into the region of Laconia. Over time, Sparta started encroaching on the territory of Messenia, eventually leading to war. Sparta gained more land in this conflict, which they divided between their citizens and the Perioikoi. The aftermath of the Second Messenian War, from 640 to 620 BCE, then divided the population into three groups, the Homoioi, the Perioikoi, and the Helots. The Helots of Laconia mostly respected Sparta's rule and did not cause much trouble. However, Helots from Messenia supposedly resisted the Spartans, Although sources can only confirm one revolt for certain, which occurred in Messenia in 464 BCE. During the 5th century BCE, Helots were quite active in the army, especially during the Peloponnesian War. They served as hoplites on land and as rowers during naval battles. In both cases, they gave Sparta an important numerical advantage. For every Spartan on the battlefield, there were at least seven Helots. Although many ancient sources say Spartans had a hostile relationship with Helots, they were much more likely to treat them better in times of war. For example, 
when 300 Helots and 120 elite Spartans were captured by Athens during the Battle of Sphacteria in 425 BCE. The Spartans promised the Helots their freedom if they served them well in combat. Similarly, around the same time, the Spartan general Brasidas fought a battle alongside 700 Helots. Impressed by their courage and loyalty, Brasidas later freed them all and allowed them to join the Perioikoi. Perioikoi were another group of Sparta's population. They lived not in the city itself, but in its surrounding areas. The Perioikoi were never hostile against the Spartans. In fact, both groups together were known by the collective name Lacedaemonians. Perioikic cities had their own autonomy and sanctuaries, but they were always bound to Sparta. They were allowed to develop their own local laws and economies, but could never reach a level of prosperity that rivaled their parent state. I see you finished. I hope you have a better appreciation for Spartan society. Nothing we do is without a reason, and every man, woman, and child has a role to play. What would you like to do? Is that so? Then let us begin. During which battle were Elots promised their freedom? The Battle of Salamis was a glorious naval engagement where we managed to drive back a host of Persian ships. But we did not promise to free our Elots. Try a different answer. Yes, in the Battle of Stacteria, a group of elite Spartans promised to free their accompanying Elots if they helped the Spartans during a siege. Next question. Which of the following is another name for Spartan citizens? Spartan citizens were also called Omni, which meant equals. One final question. Which Spartan general freed 700 Elots? Correct. Brasidas freed 700 Elots as a reward for their exemplary military service. You passed. I'm impressed. Of course. Follow me. The one politics and philosophy tour. Being statesman and military commander has a cunning mind behind his golden locks. So we're gonna wrap up Sparta. Greetings, visitor. You stand in Sparta's political center, where all of the city's most important decisions were made. You should feel honored. Spartans may be unequaled on the battlefield, but some situations are better solved by a meeting of minds than a clash of swords. Not many, mind you, but some. 
Sparta's political system was unique in the Greek world. Well, Athenians wasted hours on end whining and wagging their tongues at each other. Spartan kings made their decisions swiftly and deliberately. They preferred action over words. Come find me again when you finish your visit. We will speak more then. Farewell. Sparta's political system differed from most of Greece's. One of its most distinctive features was that it was ruled by two kings. These kings belonged to two separate dynasties, the Europontids and the Aegeads, both of which were said to be descended from Heracles. Both kings shared equal powers, and disputes between them required the intervention of special magistrates known as ephors. However, if one of the kings were more charismatic or experienced, they could influence the weaker king's choices. Spartan kings had several responsibilities and functions. As lifetime magistrates, they were technically Sparta's priests and strategists, and their duties encompassed everything from politics to justice. Originally, both kings would lead military campaigns in times of war. However, from 507 BCE onwards, only one of the two kings could be head of the army. On the battlefield, kings were accompanied by 300 elite soldiers for protection. But being a king wasn't only about working and fighting, they enjoyed special privileges as well. Spartan kings lived at the expense of the city, owned royal estates in the surrounding perioikic cities, and received the majority of the spoils of war. When they passed away, they were buried with special honors, and the population mourned them for a period of 10 days. The kings of Sparta enjoyed many important religious honors. They were in charge of sacrifices, both during military campaigns and at home. The kings received double portions of the meat at all communal meals, and they were also the first to pour libations. They also personally conducted public sacrifices as priests, which helped remind their subjects of their divine connection to Heracles and Zeus. The ephors, or overseers, were five magistrates elected by the Spartan assembly. They were chosen from among Spartan citizens over 30 and served for one year with no possibility of re-election. The ephors played a large part in administrating the city and were considered the most democratic agents in the Spartan political system. They had judicial power and ordered the dispatching of the Spartan army during wars. They also met and negotiated with representatives from other states, in addition to running the agoge, the Spartan education system. While not as powerful as the two kings, the ephors still held great sway over Sparta's affairs. The Gerousia was the Spartan Council of Elders. It was made up of the two current kings, as well as 28 elders called Gerontes. 
They were Spartan citizens over the age of 60, the cutoff age for military duty. They were elected for life by the Spartan Assembly. The Gerousia, similar to Athens' Boule, handled legislative and financial matters. It could submit bills and motions to the Assembly, and could also cancel Assembly decisions with the power of veto. To ensure that the right of veto did not weaken the Assembly, ephors were introduced to keep the Gerousia in check and maintain a steady balance of power. This allowed Sparta to include more just elements in its political system. The Spartan Assembly, or the Appella, was made up of Spartan citizens who were over 30 years old. Its exact meeting place remains unknown, but it was presided over by a special member of the ephors called the eponymous ephor. The Appella had limited authority, since any decision it made could be overruled by the Gerousia. But thanks to the efforts of the ephors, it still played an important role in Spartan society. The Appella dealt with topics like foreign affairs, war declarations, peace negotiations, and more. They also elected ephors and Gerousia members, and could both grant political rights to foreigners and remove them from Spartan citizens. Unlike the myriad sources on the functions of the Athenian assembly, the exact details of the Appella's decision-making process are unknown. I see you finished. I hope you feel more knowledgeable about the inner workings of Spartan politics. Our way of ruling was not conventional, to say the least, but it served our purposes well. What would you like to do? Are you? We shall see. Let's begin. What was the name of the Spartan Assembly? The Yerosia was the Council of Elders. Try again. Correct. The Spartan Assembly was known as the Appella. Question two. How many members did the Yerosia have? There were 28 Yerontes on the Council of Elders, but they weren't the only members of the Yerosia. Keep trying. Yes, the Yerosia consisted of 28 Yerontes and the two kings of Sparta. Last question. What was the name of the Spartan education program? Correct. Our rigorous education program was called the Agogi, and it was overseen by the Air Force. You've done well, Visitor. Very well. As you wish. Come with me. Bye, Grandpa. Thanks for all the tours.
We are in Attica. Operate secretly from upper echelons of society. Where's modified Greek theater mask? Two politics and three daily life. That's all we got left. Sidra? In the 5th century BCE, all citizens could theoretically attend the Athenian Assembly, which governed not only civic affairs, but also the affairs of an entire empire. Needless to say, managing the Assembly was complex, and one of the main challenges was ensuring the meetings were conducted in a timely fashion. It was especially important that every citizen was given the same amount of time to speak. For this reason, a water clock known as a klepsidra was set up at the Pinks to ensure every orator spoke for the same allotted time. A clepsidra was made up of two large vases, one above the other, and a small tube. The tube poured water into the bomb vase over the course of six minutes. Then the vases were switched and the process repeated itself. In addition to keeping time at assembly meetings, clepsidra were also important in courts of law, where they ensured both the prosecution and the defense had equal time to speak. So basically like hydro sand timers. Hey, Pericles. One of the Athenian democ democracy's unique features was the practice of ostracism. Originally implemented to prevent the rise of another tyrant, ostracism involved the temporary exiling of an Athenian by his fellow citizens. Every year, citizens would vote in the assembly over whether or not an ostracism would take place. If they voted yes, Another vote would later be held in the Agora to determine which citizen would be ostracized. Each citizen wrote the name of a potential candidate on a fragment of pottery called an ostraca. If more than 6,000 votes were cast, the person who was named most frequently had 10 days to leave the city, after which he would remain in exile for 10 years. From 487 BCE to 415, a number of prominent Athenians were ostracized for a variety of reasons. Relatives of Hippias, the last tyrant of Athens, were exiled after they were suspected of wanting to overthrow the city's democracy. The general Cimon, meanwhile, was ostracized for pursuing an unsuccessful policy of friendship with Sparta. But perhaps the most famous ostracism was that of Themistocles, a general renowned for his exemplary service in the Greco-Persian Wars. Was that the one we took part in? I forget. That's not a hundred people. While Athens did not have a bureaucracy in place of permanently running to permanently run the city and the rest of its empire, it did elect more than 1,000 officials every year to manage its affairs. Most of these officials had very minor responsibilities and therefore only worked part-time. The vast majority of officials were chosen by lot, but the most important ones were elected by popular vote in the Athenian assembly. In both cases, Citizens who wished to hold one of the positions had to first nominate themselves. Citizens had to be 30 years old to qualify for an official position, and even then, they could still be dismissed. Despite these limitations, however, up to 5% of all Athenian citizens were appointed or elected to official positions on a yearly basis, or became part of the Council of 500. Depending on the year, up to 100 officials were elected. The most important of these were the 10 generals, or strategoi. The generals were officially in charge of military matters, but over the course of the 5th century BCE, their influence expanded to political matters as well. For example, Pericles was elected general 15 times between 443 and 429, and used that time to cement his hold on Athenian politics. this one. That is pottery. 
We've got a bunch of these over in areas that don't have any tours. Well, I might as well do this one since we're here. Let's learn about politics and philosophy. Are we going to see Socrates again? Probably. Τι βουλιάρχεστε ο άνθρωπε; 